prayer, Brother Randy. Thank you for that. I'd like to invite you, if you would, take your Bible and let's look in the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter number 7. Once you've found your place in Mark 7, if you want to put a, the ribbon of your Bible on that page or maybe a piece of paper, hold your place there in Mark 7. That's going to be our text for the night. But once you've found Mark 7, if you would look also over in Matthew, the preceding gospel, Matthew chapter 15. I'd like to read some scripture to you from that passage. As we look in these passages tonight, I'd like to remind you that last week we studied how Jesus dealt with some difficult people, the religious leaders in Israel during his day. And in our passage in Mark 7, we see the Lord Jesus, he's turning from the difficult religious people towards the common folks. And he addresses his attention in, a, in a, an important message to the multitude of, of the common folks. It's almost like he kind of walks away from the, the difficult religious crowd and just goes to the common people. And we want to read that passage in a moment. But if you would, there in Matthew 15... Matthew 15 records the same event that we studied last week in Mark 7. I'd like to read it to you if you'll follow along, beginning in verse 1. Number 1, just to kind of remind us of what we studied last week, then to see something uh, significant at the end of this passage. Verse 1 of Matthew 15, the Bible says, Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, that's the difficult people, right? Uh, they were of Jerusalem saying, why? Now at this point, they should have been saying, wow, what a Savior. But they're saying, why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But you say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. You hypocrites. Remember, he's still talking to these religious leaders. And he's calling them hypocrites. When we say hypocrites, what does that mean, y'all? Mm -hmm. Yes, person that says one thing and does another. A pretender. Mm -hmm. Putting on a show. Okay. That's what religious lost people tend to do. Verse 7, he says, You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draw nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And he called the multitude, and said unto them, Hear and understand, not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. We're going to read that passage, Lord willing, in, in Mark tonight. But look at verse 12. Then came his disciples, Jesus' disciples, and said to Jesus, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying, Jesus, don't you know you upset the religious leaders? You said some pretty strong things about them, and you called them hypocrites. Verse 13, But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted, shall be rooted up. Then look at those next three words, y'all, verse 14. He says, let them alone. There might be some people that come into your life, 
God would just tell you, leave them alone. And so now as we go to Mark chapter 7, if you'll look there with me, please, in Mark 7. I'm not going to read as long as the passage, but we pick up in verse 14. And here now we're seeing what Jesus had said after he had basically called out the hypocrites. Mark 7 and verse 14, and I'm going to ask if you would now, just out of respect for God's word, if you're willing and if you're able, and give you a chance to stretch if you'll stand with me and follow with me now here in verse 14 of Mark 7. And when Jesus had called all the people unto him, he said unto them, Hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand. There is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was entered into the house from the people, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. And Jesus said unto them, watch this, y'all, we're going to read down to verse 23. Don't miss this, young people, I want to encourage you to follow along here. Verse uh, 18, Jesus said unto them, Are you so without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatsoever thing cometh from without entereth into the man, it cannot defile him? But it entereth not into his heart, but into the belly, and goeth out into the draught, purging all meats. And he said, That which cometh out of the man that defileth the man, for from within, within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murder, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and defile the man. I'd like to share a message with you tonight. It comes right from verse 28. The title is, For From Within. Let's have a word of prayer, then we'll get into the message. Father, thank you for this time. I pray now that you would help us all, Lord, young and not quite as young. Help us all to be very attentive for these next few moments. Lord, deliver us from distractions. Help us not to uh, uh, interrupt or distract a neighbor. Lord, give your word good success. Lord, as I, uh, as I speak to people's ears, may you speak to our hearts. Please show us something tonight that we should glean from this message. And Lord, we need a new touch from you tonight. We thank you for the work you did on our hearts this past weekend with the conference. Lord, we ask that you would continue to tug on our hearts we pray this in Christ's name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Hey, uh, I, I love now as we read through these Gospels, the Lord has been uh, reminding me for some months now, that as we read about the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospel of Mark. Christians, I want you to hear this. Wesley, don't miss this, man. The same Jesus that we're reading about in the Gospel of Mark, if you've been saved the Bible way, that same Jesus now lives inside of you. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. And then it was just such a blessing uh, this past Monday night. And, and boy, I wrote it down as one of the great truths I've learned or I've been reminded of in uh, recent months. But uh, we were told or reminded on Monday night, this same Jesus is praying for us. Amen. The same Jesus we just read about in Matthew 15 and here in Mark 7. For those of us who are saved, He lives in us. And he's praying for you. Jesus Christ prayed for you today. Isn't that encouraging? And, and now check this out. As we look at this passage, verses 14 through 23 of this chapter, I want you to notice with me three things, all right? Watch this if you would. I want you to notice, first of all, please, I want you to understand the context uh, of, of this event, of this passage. At the beginning of the chapter, the Pharisees, these religious leaders, they were talking about 
traditions and being defiled and things that are clean and unclean. Please remember this. In the Old Testament, specifically, oh, in the book of Leviticus, especially Leviticus chapter 11, God gave the Israelites certain dietary laws to separate them from the dietary practices of the pagans. In other words, in the Old Testament, God gave his earthly people, the, the Hebrews, the Jews, he gave them some, some laws about what he said he wanted them to eat, what he didn't want them to eat. And their menu was going to be different than what the non-Israelites, the non-people of God, tended to eat. And what God was wanting to do was make a difference between that which was holy, dedicated to them, and that him, and that which was unholy. And those laws God gave to Israel about 1,400 years before the story we read in Mark 7. These ceremonial laws, the dietary laws, had been given to the Israelites over a thousand years, 1,400 years, before Jesus walked the earth in the land of Israel. Over the time between when Moses penned those laws under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost and 1,400 years later when Jesus walked on the earth, over that period of time, certain teachers added their own traditions to the law of Moses. without God's approval. It became teachings of men that were added to the laws written by Moses. First they were known as the oral traditions or the oral laws and eventually uh, Jewish scribes and religious people started writing down those oral traditions that had come from men, not from God. Not from God directing Moses to write something, but just from men's own heart. They started writing down those oral laws that had been collected over the centuries. And together, as a, as a whole, those oral laws were known as the Mishnah. The Mishnah. By the time that Jesus was walking on the earth in Mark 7... The scribes and the Pharisees had heavy, unbiblical demands on the people, and a lot of that was coming from the Mishnah, the oral laws, the oral traditions that had been passed on by, by men who were not inspired of God. Does that make sense? Are you with me there? So these religious leaders had these set of teachings coming from men that were separate from the writings of Moses and the Word of God. And over time, the scribes and the Pharisees and the religious leaders started saying these traditions, started treating these traditions as if they were more important and more valuable than the Word of God itself. What we are witnessing in the first half of Mark chapter 7 is our Lord Jesus Voiding traditions and systems that had been influencing Israel for centuries. I mean, he's throwing out some bombs here. He's saying, you religious leaders have been teaching the people wrong. You've been emphasizing traditions instead of the word of God. And it's radical. It's... It's quite a statement, quite a position our Lord is taking. So please, first of all, I want you to understand the context of what's going on here when we read these verses in Mark 7. The Lord Jesus is taking a stand against the traditions of religion. Then secondly, if you look in verse 14, it says, And when Jesus had called all the people unto him. I love verse 14. Y'all, when Jesus had called... All the people unto him. He said, when it says all the people, I'm thinking men and women and teenagers, boys and girls. 
he was calling all of them unto him. He said unto them, hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand. Now, y'all, I want to encourage you to check this out. And please make note of what we're about to say. First of all, we see it was a personal call. It says in verse 14, he had called. Jesus was calling folks, and he was doing it personally. Hey, can I share this with y'all, beloved, as a word of encouragement tonight? He's calling out to you. He's calling out to you. The same Lord Jesus that we read about in the Bible, the same Lord Jesus that died on the cross for your sins, and he was buried, and he rose again the third day, the same Lord Jesus that saved your soul, listen now, listen, and the same Lord Jesus that now lives in you, friend, I want you to know, he wants your attention. He's calling out to you. Personally. And it's not like he's having Pastor Steve do it. It's not like he's having some angel from heaven do it. He, if you'll listen and be still and be quiet, the Lord is calling you. He has something he wants to say, especially if you're one of his children. Hey, I, I've, there are five young ladies walking on this earth today that uh, every now and then I want to have something to say to them. You know what? Because they're my children. They're my daughters. And uh, one of them, uh, she's in the army and she's getting ready to get deployed to Hawaii. Now, I know that's a very dangerous combat zone, right? But I believe the Lord is probably calling Melanie and me to go and and spend time with my daughter in Hawaii sooner or later. It's Amen. just probably something we're going to have to do for a week or two, okay? I know it's going to be a sacrifice. But uh, just, I'm going to ask you, Brother Randy, to get prepared ahead of time, have some messages ready for when uh, Miss Melly and I go to visit my daughter at her base in Hawaii. But uh, she, uh, she's, this coming weekend is her last weekend. And uh, she's invited Melanie and me and her husband's parents to meet them at Longhorn Steakhouse on Friday night in Brunswick for kind of like our last get together before my daughter and her husband, who's also in the army, he's also getting deployed to Hawaii. But I'm saying all that, say, you can mark it down. There's some things I'm going to want to say, I'm going to want to communicate to my daughter. Amen. Share my heart with her. And y'all, if you have been saved, you are a child of the Lord. Amen. And he's got some things he's going to want to say to you. It was a personal call. I like this also. It was a universal call. It says he had called all the people. There's not a, room, a person in this room that Jesus doesn't have something he wants to say to you. Amen. Every man and woman, every young person in this room, the Lord's got something he wants to say to you. And I like this. It says when he had called all the people unto him it's a specific call hey watch this young people the Lord wants you to get close to him mm. hey I want you to come here I want you to get close to me there's something I want to say to you now watch this after he calls the people unto them then he talks to them but we want to get close to the Lord don't we and as we get close to him, he's going to start talking. And look at the first word out of his mouth. Listen to this. It says, hearken. Jesus says, hearken. You know what that word hearken means? I hope y'all will mark this down. Make note of it. When Jesus says hearken, what he's telling us is he wants you to do something with what you're about to hear. He wants you to take in the message he's about to share with you, and he wants you to internalize it. He wants you to personalize it. He wants you to apply it and just to embrace it and to respond appropriately to it. Hey, come here. I've got something I want to say to you. And what I'm about to say to you, I want you to, I want you to do something with it. Just don't let it go in one ear and out the other. Take it and eternalize it and make it a part of your life. 
when he says hearken, that basically means I want you to listen and I want you to do and I want you to accept what I'm about to tell you. And then he goes into this parable about things we bring into our bodies and things that come out of our hearts. Always remember this, please. When he says, hearken, he says, I want you to listen. And not just listen, but I want you to do something with it. I want you to respond to it. I want you to obey it. Always remember this. Young people, I hope you write this down. A sermon is never complete until it's put into practice. Usually, Pastor Steve, I, maybe I try to get done preaching on Sundays by about 12.05 or 12.10, usually. But that sermon's really not done. Now, a message from the Lord, God wants us to put that sermon into practice. Amen? Amen. Then if you'll notice this final point with me tonight. Verses 15 through 23, where the Lord Jesus talks about things that enter into a man and things that come from within a man. Here, um, we're seeing Jesus identify some truth about sin. Look at verse 15, please. Jesus says, There is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. When you think of the word, when you see the word defiled, I'd like you to think of the word sin or evil. The Lord Jesus is saying, when we, when we put food in our bodies, it's going to go straight to our belly. And that's not bringing in sin. When we have a meal, it goes straight to our belly. But the Lord Jesus says the things that come out of our heart, that's what defiles. That's what is evil. That's what is sin. Y'all listen to this. Man tends to have a different opinion of sin than God has of sin, mm -hmm. doesn't he? Mm -hmm. okay? Man's opinion of sin, he might call sin an accident. God says sin is an abomination. For you young people, and you, you might not know what the word abomination means. It means it's, it's detestable. Or you could say it this way. God looks at sin as something that makes him sick at his stomach. It's not funny to God. Man's opinion of sin, man would say, uh, sin is just a trifle. It's, it's just a small thing. But God says, no, sin is a tragedy. It'll bring destruction and ruin. And death. Man's opinion of sin, man will say, uh, sin, uh, it's just a weakness in my life. God says, no, it's wickedness. Amen. Remember that now. As you consider these words of the Lord Jesus in this passage. From verse 15, again, if you look at verse 15 with me, Jesus says, there is nothing from without a man that entering into him, or entering into his belly, as the Lord would say it later in verse 19, entering into his belly can defile him, but the things which come out of him, out of his heart, those are the things that defile the man. Y'all hear this truth about sin from our Savior. Sin is primarily a spiritual matter rather than a physical matter. Jesus is not talking about being healthy. He's talking about being holy. We don't need a Savior because of what we put into our stomachs. We need a Savior because of what we have in our hearts. Mm. Then look with me uh, one more time at verses 18 and 19, if you would please. Verse 18, Jesus said unto them, Are you so without understanding? Do you not perceive that whatsoever thing come from without entereth into the man, it cannot defile him? If you eat something, that's not going to make you sinful. Not necessarily so. Verse 19, Because it entereth not into his heart, but into the belly, and goeth out into the draught, purging all meats. 
In other words, sin is primarily an internal matter more than it is an external matter. In this situation, the food that we eat never touches our hearts, right? Mm -hmm. the, the real us, the, the core of us, that food never gets there. It's a spiritual matter. And then finally, if you look at verse 20 through 23, Jesus said, that which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man from, from within, out of the heart, of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, and so forth. Listen to this, y'all. Sin, here's the truth we're learning. Don't miss this. Sin is a potential within us before it is made a reality by us. When we look at these verses from 20 through 23, the Lord Jesus is letting us know that any of us, given the right set of circumstances, are capable of doing anything. Because of sin in our lives. Watch this, y'all. In verse 21, Jesus says, Out of our hearts proceed evil thoughts. That refers to evil designs, evil plans. He mentions thoughts, first of all. Do you see that? It all starts with a thought. Somebody said that uh, one thought can lead to an action. An action can lead to a habit. A habit can lead to a character. And a character can lead to a destiny. It all starts with a thought. Here in verse, 20, verse 21, he starts off with an evil design, evil thoughts, evil plans. And then the next six items he lists are actually evil deeds. But the evil deeds always start off with an evil thought. May God help you and me to guard our thoughts. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hey, that's another reason to reading much of the Bible. is just to develop a biblical mindset. To learn to think biblically. To renew our minds with the scripture. These evil deeds... Start off with an evil thought. Evil thoughts, verse 21. Then adulteries. That's unfaithful to the marriage vows. Fornications. That can, a for, a, the sin of fornication can refer to any kind of a sexual perversion. Or any kind of inappropriate sexual behavior. Murders. All these things come from the heart. Hey, uh, do you remember what, was it Nipsey, Rel, uh, Nipsey Russell? The, uh, the black comedian, do you remember what he, I think it was Nipsey Russell, he used to be famous for saying, the devil made me what, y'all? Was, was, was it Flip Wilson? Okay, thank you. The devil made me what? Do it. He would say, the devil made me do it. But that's not true. It comes from within, from our hearts. Evil thoughts, which lead to evil deeds. Isn't it interesting, those first two or three uh, evil deeds are all... Uh, sexually related mm. Mm. and then it talks about murders oh just the violence in our world today mm. but up above the word murders I know it's not just limited when, we, when he talks about murders I know it's not just limited to this activity but right up above the word murders see how it's plural I wrote up the word abortion mm. the murder that takes place just in this country alone my understanding is almost 3,000 Abortions took place just in America today. Not counting around the world. The Lord is saying, that's a problem of the heart. And then he talks about thefts. Hey, uh, many Christians, they, they would never take a gun and rob a bank, right? Or they would never, many Christians, they would never steal a purse from a, a senior citizen lady. But sad to say, some Christians, they try to cheat the IRS, don't they? Mm -hmm. That's just as much a theft. Yep. Hey, and, and, believe me, I don't want to pay the IRS a single penny more than what they are supposed to get. That's Not right. a single dime. Amen. But I do want to pay what the government claims I owe them. And I don't want to steal from them. 
thefts. And then it says covetousness. That's a greedy desire for more. Then look at verse 22. The Jesus says, from, from the heart stems thefts, covetousness, and wickedness. You know what the word wickedness refers to there? Wickedness there involves the desire to recruit others and to get other people involved in your sin. It all starts from the heart. I want to take some others with me. I want to go down in this sin and want to bring some others down with me. That's the term used there when Jesus says wickedness. Deceit. Deceit is referring to misrepresentation. Not giving the full picture. Misleading someone. Leaving out some important information intentionally. That's deceit. Lasciviousness. That's unrestrained behavior. An evil eye. An evil eye starts with, a, with an evil heart. An evil eye that refers to jealousy. Blasphemy is slander against God. Pride refers to uplifting oneself while debasing or, or cutting down another. Pride. And then foolishness there, that last item in the list, that's living a life without God. And then verse 23 says, all these evil things, everything that we just read about, come from within and defile the man. We could say it this way. The heart of the problem is a problem of the heart. It's not Satan. It's not our ex-spouse. It's us. It's our own hearts. Billy Graham said that our hearts are a storehouse of evil. My dad, I never heard my dad say this personally, but I had the, the, the former pastor of Lulaton Baptist, Brother Monroe Gill, he told me he heard my dad say this. My dad said, we are more wicked than we think. Boy, you look at that list, it makes sense. Let me tie all this up for you. Here's, here we see how Jesus identifies sin. And by the way, that same Jesus lives in our hearts right now, right? And uh, one thing about the Lord Jesus living in our hearts, if we choose to go the way of our, our evil hearts, the way of sin, it, it, he's going he's gonna to be expressing some displeasure. He's going to start dealing with us about it. That's how you know a person is saved. If they say they're saved, but they just kind of go on in their sin and it doesn't seem to bother them, it seems to be, you know, maybe an accident or a weakness or maybe just a joke, that's an indication there that the Son of God really doesn't live in that person. Because when He's in your heart, He's going to start dealing with you about those evil things. But... Uh, let me share these verses with you. I'd like to read one to you that I'm going to ask you to turn with me in a final scripture uh, in a moment. 1 John 3, verse 5, the Bible says, And you know that Jesus was manifested to take away our sins. And the rest of that verse says, And in him is no sin. And when I got saved, me with my evil heart, I had someone come and live inside of me who has no evil. The Lord Jesus. And oh, we want Him to run the show, don't we? Mm -hmm. We want Him to lead the way and have His way in our lives, not our own hearts. But then if you would, look at 2 Corinthians 5. This will be our last verse tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. Boy, if, if it wasn't for the Lord Jesus, we'd be in a mess, wouldn't we? Mm -hmm. We'd still be on our own with that evil heart. And we know that what comes from within, when we're left on our own, all those evil practices we just read about. But look at this last verse, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. It says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, if you've been saved, you are a new creature.
Praise the Lord. We don't have to be ruled by that old evil heart anymore. We've got the spirit of our Lord living inside of us. Oh, Lord, would you take over and make us what we ought to be? Listen, listen, listen. It's not going to be religion. It's not going to be the Baptist church. It's not going to be the Catholic church. It's not going to be the Lutheran church that can take away our sin and change our lives. Amen. It won't happen. It has to be in Christ. When you get saved, when you're in Christ, He makes you a new creature. Amen. The church can never do that. That's right. Can I hear an amen on that? Amen. Oh, do you know Him today? If you bow your heads with me, please, and close your eyes. I'm not going to ask Brother Randy to play any music tonight, but just with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, and just be here just a little while longer. Let me ask you this. What is the condition of your heart? I can tell you tonight, based on the Bible, not on what the Baptists say, or the Lutherans, or the Methodists, or the Mormons, but based on what the Bible says, if you don't have Jesus in your heart, then you've got a heart of wickedness and sin. It doesn't matter how long you go to church. It doesn't matter how much you read the Bible. It doesn't matter how much you've played the game. You've got to have Jesus in your heart. He's the only one that can take away your sin and make you a new person. No church can ever do that. Amen. Do you have the Lord in your heart? If not, your heart is still in sin. If you would say, Pastor, would you pray for me tonight? I've been religious, but I've never had a clean heart. I've never been saved. I've never invited the Lord in. Pastor, would you pray for me tonight? Anyone like that, raise your hand. I want to pray for you. I want to remind you, friend, the Bible says Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Only he can save you from your sin. Amen. You can't take that sin away. Mary can't do it for you. The Pope can't do it. Mm. Only Jesus. You can't even save yourself. Amen. You must believe on the Lord. Let's have a word of prayer. God, thank you for this time. Thank you for letting us have this study in your word. Lord, thank you for your teaching on sin. Lord, you call these behaviors covetousness, pride, an evil eye, jealousy, evil thoughts. Lord, you call them evil. You say these kind of things, these behaviors, they defile us. They make us corrupt in the eyes of God. It's sin. Lord, help our, help our thinking on sin to line up with your thinking on sin. And I pray, Lord, for that person here tonight, whether it be a child or an adult, Lord, that's never been saved the Bible way, please, God, we ask you in Christ's name, please give them a great awareness of their own personal sin. Amen. Help them to see the exceeding sinfulness of of their sin and convince them of the reality of hell convince them of the truth of the gospel and please help them to see their need not of religion not of a moral life not of being a good person but help them to see their need of the Lord Jesus Christ and give them the desire and the courage and the faith to be saved the Bible way we pray in Christ's name, amen. God bless you. Hope you have a good night.
believe it when I see it. <laughs> I'm not going to have all that faith in that. 